Welcome to the Tennessee Achieves Virtual Community Service Webinar. These webinars are designed to provide you, Tennessee Promise students, with an opportunity to learn more about college success tips, careers in your potential field of study, and other topics we think you will find interesting while you are navigating your educational journey. These webinars will also help you complete your community service requirement while it may be difficult for you to do so at this time. A few housekeeping details before we get started. By logging in as a Tennessee Achieve student, we are able to track your attendance and how long you remain actively engaged during the webinar. Once you complete the webinar, you will automatically be given credit for one hour of community service. We will track how long you watch, and if you do not watch the webinar in its entirety, you will not receive credit. You do not need to complete the community service form for these webinars. Tennessee Achieves will log your hours for you. Tennessee Achieves staff and partners across the state are providing important insight and information we think you will find entertaining and informative. We hope you enjoy this new series of webinars. So I'm thrilled to be here today. My name is Chrissy D'Alejandro. I'm the executive director of Tennessee Achieves. I've been here um, for 13 years, which is just mind blowing to me, um, considering I started this mayor when I was 12, right? So just 25 <laughs> years old, <laughs> no, no, uh, a very long time. Um, I was talking about Tennessee Achieves recently to someone and I said, it's part of my identity. I love this program so much that it's hard to separate Chrissy D'Alejandro from the work that we do here. But I will tell you, um, part of the reason that we launched Find Your Why, which is a statewide campaign really focused on student voice, specifically students who may not have college as a foregone conclusion in their lives. When we launched Knox Achieves in 2008, the idea was to provide an opportunity for every student to earn a college credential, but we were really focused on that student who maybe thought that college was not an option for them. The attempt was to break down many of the barriers that often these students are presented. And what has resulted now is Tennessee Promise, where we can now say to first graders, college is your destiny. But part of that conversation has to come with what I often call finding that fire in your belly. What is it about you as a person that really makes you excited and want to dig in when it gets tough? This is particularly true for students who, like me, were the first in their families to go to college. I feel like I should caveat it for the entire group before I make introductions in saying that um, my parents were great. I'm sure all the panelists here would also say they had really great supportive parents. But the difference oftentimes for first generation students is because you're the first one making this journey, it's often a little bit scarier. It's often a bit more intimidating. And it's often that you face barriers that you don't have a quick phone call home to say like, hey, mom, this happened in the bursar's office. I know Tina Walker, my mom would have said, what's a bursar, right? And so thinking through that, through the lens of a first generation student, Tennessee Achieves just wants to have a conversation today with our panelists about their journey in hopes of helping ignite that fire in our class of 2021. So they see that they're not the first one to have these thoughts. They're not the first ones to experience these challenges. And that they also, I think most importantly, have a lifeline someone that's not only there to support you, but also that just gets it, right? Like there are many of us at Tennessee Achieves, Mayor Ragsdale representing our board member. We just get it. We've been there too. And so I wanted to kick off to say like this, I think is maybe one of the most important conversations that we will have, especially in 2021, when life feels chaotic and uncertain, we want you to feel positive about making that transition to post-secondary, and we want to help you find what motivates you. I am so excited about today's panel, um, two of which I know really well, and I'm super excited to get to know Oscar, our student better, who will no doubt steal the show today. But first, as I said, um, we have a Tennessee Achieves board member, a founding Tennessee Achieves board member, and 
Um, although Randy Boyd and Bill Haslam get lots of credit in the Tennessee Promise space, both of which um, deserve that credit, it really was Mayor Mike Ragsdale who had the idea and who brought this idea from uh, something that was scribbled on a whiteboard to what we now know has helped nearly 450,000 students have the opportunity to earn a post-secondary credential tuition and fee free, but also with all sorts of different layers of support. So the mayor was my boss for six years. There's, I'm sure a really great bio I can read about you mayor, but um, he was my boss for six years um, when I worked as deputy chief of staff in the mayor's office. Um, he took a chance on a kid that had no idea what she was doing. But I think part of what um, built our relationship is we have a really similar story. Both grew up in small town, Tennessee, the mayor grew up in Cleveland. He was the first person in his family to go to college. He went on to get a PhD. I was a PhD student when I first landed in the mayor's office. Um, I think he's got a really big heart um, and much of that heart is rooted in education and providing opportunities for others. Um, he's the kind of person that puts others before himself. I saw it time and again when we were in the mayor's office. He's still a part of the Tennessee Achieves Board and very much still a part of my life. So thanks for being here, Mayor. Glad to be here. Another panelist is Summer Deason. Summer has been, it feels like Summer has been at Tennessee Achieves for a really long time, uh, but she's one of our newer Tennessee Achieves members. Although, Summer, this is coming up on your second year, right? At yeah, Tennessee. we're coming up pretty close to year two. Which is crazy. So I'm from McMinnville, Tennessee, or McMinnville, um, if you... <laughs> <laughs> went on to Swanee and tried to sound a little bit more sophisticated, but my parents would say Macmanville, Tennessee. Um, Sumner grew up there too, so she's a hometown girl. Um, she's also the first person in her family to go to college. I will tell you that Sumner serves as one of our complete coaches. So we launched an initiative at Tennessee Achieves in 2018 known as Complete, where we provide a dedicated coach to students who often fall in sort of these high risk categories um, to help them navigate the path to post-secondary. Sumner actually serves as one of our Knox Promise coaches, which is a Haslam family funded pilot that not only provides a coach for every student, but also provides some completion grant funding. Sumner's students love Sumner so much and she is so crazy dedicated to her students. I can tell you if Sumner asked me to do something for her students, I always say yes, because I always know it's coming from a place of putting the student at the center of the conversation. And I will tell you, we're just really, really fortunate to have Sumner as one of our coaches. So thanks for being here, Sumner. Thank you. And then we have Oscar. Oscar is um, from Lincoln County, not originally, but I don't want to steal your story, but he currently lives um, in Fayetteville, Tennessee. So I love this theme of like rural, like, right, we're all first gen, but we're also um, coming from a rural perspective. Oscar is a student at Motlow State. And what I hear, and again, Oscar, not going to steal your thunder, but that he's really also passionate about education and wants to be an educator. So I'm really excited to hear from Oscar. I will tell you that my team, Oscar, raves about you. Ben Sterling specifically has been so excited for you to be a part of our panel. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I appreciate it so much. I appreciate them too for always trying to put me on a spotlight, I guess. That's great. We love highlighting our students, so we're really excited about you being here. Um, Mayor, why don't you, even though I've given a brief introduction, just talk a little bit um, about um, your journey, how you made it from Cleveland High School to the University of Tennessee and beyond, and then what you do now. That's um, quite a journey. I grew up in Cleveland, Tennessee, and my job was uh, washing cars at Benton Pond, Mayak, and Buick, and I enjoyed that job and it was a good job to have. But with that being said, it was the type of job you knew you didn't want to have forever because it got awfully hot in the summer and awfully cold in the winter. 
And so I had an opportunity to go to college uh, because of a lot of encouragement from my mom and dad. Neither of my parents uh, or in truly anybody in my family had ever had an opportunity to go to college. And it's much like you said, Chrissy, it's not that we had bad parents. We had great parents. Uh, I couldn't have done it without them. They wanted me to go, but they didn't have experiences that they could really share with me to help. But they uh, provided a lot of encouragement. I would view college as not an option in their eyes for me. It was almost a requirement that they something that they wanted me to do that would improve my life. So back in the fall of 1971, which really dates me compared to the rest of the folks on this show today, um, I had an opportunity to go to the University of Tennessee. And back in those days, uh, the university was open to anyone who was a Tennessee high school graduate. That's changed. Nowadays, if my uh, resume or transcript would pass across the desk in the admissions office, it would have been laughed at. It's like, this guy thinks <laughs> he can get into the University of Tennessee. Well, back then they had to take it. And thank goodness they did, because it turned out well. It's a great experience for me. And so I actually, uh, like Oscar, had an interest in education. I wanted to be an educator. My first job was at Mississippi State Community College. And from there, I left and spent 16 years in private business in Knoxville, then eight years in the mayor's office, and prior to that, eight years as a county commissioner. And so, Oscar, be really cautious, because a lot of people who start out in education end up in politics. And, you know, that same thing could happen to you. But it was a <laughs> really, really fun journey for me to do that. And when term limits hit and I left office in 2010, along with uh, someone who Chrissy's incredibly familiar with that we all work together, Mike Arms, we formed a company, Tennessee Strategies, and we work with companies now across Tennessee. And so it's been a, a great experience. But all those experiences, I think, would not have been possible if I had not had the opportunity to go to college. So I owe a great deal to the University of Tennessee and to my mom and dad for providing the encouragement, even if they didn't have a lot of background, they could help me out when I first started. You know, Mayor, I know your story um, because I was your speech writer um, in the mayor's office. Um, I, do you mind sharing the story about um, your 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 friend, Mark, and the tip top bags and the army locker and the call to your parents. I think that story would really resonate. Yeah, and sure. When we left to go to UT in 1971, I'll never forget my very best friend, Mark Tasman, who's now an incredibly successful businessman in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my mom and dad borrowed the next door neighbor's station wagon and we went to the University of Tennessee and my clothes were packed and my dad's old army locker, but we were much the Ragsdales were way ahead of the Tasmans because Mark had his bag or clothes packed and two grocery bags from Tip Top Food Town in Cleveland. So think about that. You roll up in an old beat up army locker and a couple of grocery bags and, and you move into the dorm. And I'll never forget, I'm almost embarrassed to tell this story because one of the things I wanted my mom to do is to go buy me what I would refer to as a store-bought blanket where I wouldn't have just a, an old homemade quilt on my bed. And of course she did that. Nowadays, the quilt would have been much more in, in vogue than that cheap blanket was that we ended up <laughs> buying. But we were quite the sight when we arrived there. And so UT started out great simply because we had air conditioning in the dorm, which didn't have at home. You could eat all you wanted to at the cafeteria, which I thought was a magnificent experience. And then things took a turn for the worse after we'd been there about three days. Classes actually started for us. And it was a tough experience because we had never had anything like that before. So we had to work really, really hard to just try and keep up. And I'll never forget one day going back to my dorm, no cell phones in those days. You get on the phone. I called my dad, collect, of course, so he had to pay for it. And I told him, I said, I just can't do this. I said, it's way above my head. I can't make this. I said, come get me and, and bring me back home. And I'll never forget how he responded. It was your mom and I believe in you. Do the absolute best you can and everything will be OK. And don't be afraid to ask for help. And, you know, when you look at that, those same words of advice, I think, really ring true today. All the folks that we have in the Tennessee Achieves, Tennessee Promise programs have that ability. A lot of times it just means you got to try the absolute best you can and also don't be afraid to ask for help. And that's a strategy that's worked for me, not only through the college years, but also in life. And I think can be really good advice for others pursuing a similar path as well. 
Yeah, I love that story so much. And, you know, I have a similar story of when my parents dropped me off at Swanee, they just moved me in and then they left. And there was like a whole weekend planned for students and parents. So not only was I, I think maybe the only student at Swanee at the time that was the first in their family to go to college, it certainly yeah. felt like that. But I was navigating this first like three days where it was like parent weekend parent orientation by myself. Um, and so I had a very similar call to my parents, like sobbing, like, I, what, have, what have I gotten myself into? Like, I, I don't, I don't know how to do this all by myself. And they were like, dig in, right? Like, yeah. you wanted to be there, dig in. And so I realized really quickly, what you said is that if I was going to make it, I had to get really comfortable saying, I don't know, and asking for help. Um, right. And that was a lot of ego and pride swallowing, but I think something that's really important for our students to hear. Great. Okay, Sumner, let's talk about your journey from um, McMinnville girl to Tennessee Tech and then over to where you are now. Yeah, so I grew up in McMinnville. Um, and growing up, I was always pretty academically driven. Um, I was raised by my grandparents along with three of my younger siblings. And, you know, I had always just wanted to bring home good grades and make them proud. And it was just something that I always wanted to do. But, you know, going into high school, when you start having those conversations about college, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Like, where do you, where do you see yourself? It really had me um, thinking a lot deeper and, so when I thought about that, I just kind of, I, don't, I had this like earning and like fire in my belly. Just, I just wanted something more. I knew that there was something more out there, um, even though I didn't necessarily know like what that looked like for me, but I just wanted something different for myself and for my future family. So growing up, being the first person in my family to graduate college or go to college and, you know, being raised by my grandparents in a lower income family, Sometimes it really felt like those odds were somewhat stacked against me at times. But, you know, I came to the realization that I couldn't choose the path for other people, but I could myself and I could change that. Um, and that's what I wanted to set out to do. I have a huge passion for helping others and for serving others. And I knew in order to take that a step further that I needed to go to college and pursue that um, so that I could, you know, be able to have opportunities to um, make a difference in the lives of other families and other people. And, and it's, I'm so for, fortunate that's what I get to do currently. So good. Talk to me about why Tennessee Tech. I mean, it's like, you know, 45 minutes from home, you have younger siblings that I know you feel probably some responsibility for. Did that play into your decision? Yeah, that was a huge part of my decision. I mean, other than not knowing that Tennessee Tech is a great school, um, it, it's in a smaller town comparative to, you know, Knoxville or Nashville. Um, so it was kind of a homey feeling to me, but also, yes, then also being close to home, you know, being the oldest of my siblings, I did feel that responsibility and moving away from them was harder just because I, I couldn't always be there if they needed me or if my family needed me for any reason. Um, but having that shorter distance definitely did help and was um, I think it's what made Tennessee Tech a great fit for me. Yeah, I think fit is so important, right? When you're choosing a school, I think, you know, oftentimes when we talk about Tennessee Promise or Tennessee Achieves, the, the outside world thinks we're just trying to funnel every student into a community or technical college. And it really isn't about that for us. This is allowing every student to have the opportunity to earn a credential what we want, what we really want is for students to find the right fit for them, right? What, whatever that was. I remember when I first started looking at colleges, I really thought I wanted to go to Vanderbilt. For whatever reason, in my head, that was like the mecca of colleges, right? And then I stepped onto campus and I was like, whoa, this is like way too big for like a girl that has been, you know, in very much a small town bubble, um, and hence the reason Swanee felt like the right fit for me because um, it had um, all the components that I liked about Vanderbilt, but it, it was also like sort of sequestered in this tiny little small town. It was actually the student population was smaller than my high school. And so I liked that about it. So I think fit is really important. 
as we have conversations with students about their why. Okay, Oscar, to you, tell us a little bit about your journey. <laughs> well, my journey, it's, it's just bittersweet, kind of, I guess you can say. I grew up, my parents crossed, well, crossed over. So they're from Mexico, really. And they came to Utah, where I was born at. Um, but it was a bit of a harsh to start off with out here in the middle of nowhere when they came down this way. And, you know, as I was growing up, I, they've always told me, we want you to be something in life. We want you to do something big, something that, you know, something for others, help others, you know, stuff like that. So my family has always been my key, I guess you can say. And they've always pushed me to my limits. And, you know, for college, I had nobody really to ask questions about here and there. So I would always ask my our uh, high school advisor college, I guess you can call it call her she was like something like that and so she was a great resource at the high school which I'm currently at Motlow getting a getting a degree my associate's degree there and I don't know <laughs> I guess that's it <laughs> I don't know how to go about it yeah no well tell me a bit about um why you chose Motlow Motlow are you at the Fayetteville campus of Motlow still still able to go home to to your family in the evenings and are you working at all yes I am um so I chose Motlow here close to home because it's close to home and I didn't want I wanted the two years to kind of be a smooth transition because at first I wanted to go to MTSU, but I was like, that's a long way from home. I was like, I want to stay at home as well, like summer kind of. And then um, right now I work as an educational assistant. It's a few minutes away from my house at a local feeder school, which it's a great opportunity for me to have hands-on experience on. And, you know, it's a great foot into the education field. That's great. So, Oscar, is your plan to earn your associate's degree at Botlow and then transfer on to MTSU? Is that is that the plan? Yes, that's the plan right now of going to M uh, Motlow and then transferring to MTSU for the last two years to get my bachelor's. And I feel like later on, I'll I want to get a master's as well, but that's still floating in the air, which I feel like I will end up getting. I think that's great. I think it's good to set big, hairy, audacious goals, right? And when we started, Knox Achieves, I know the mayor would echo this, you're the exact student that we wanted to, to create a program to, to help, thinking about the idea of starting off at Montlow, being able to stay home and raise money as you think about going on to the four-year institution. So I think this is, this is so great. Mayor, some of you touched on this, but can you dig into, um, as a first-generation student, do you feel like you had unique challenges that you faced? And then, you know, thinking about those challenges, how you maneuvered to overcome them? Well, I, I think you do have some challenges. Your mom and dad, while they can be supportive, they can't provide a whole lot of advice and guidance about here's what you can expect when you go to college. They just never had the experience they didn't know. While they knew it was important to go, they couldn't help with many of the dynamics of it. And one of the things I'm, I'm really embarrassed to admit, but it was little small things, like you were saying, nobody knew what the bursar was at an institution. I remember when I got my first schedule, it had classes that showed MWF. I figured out that meant Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But on the schedule, it also had TR. And for some reason, in my mind, I thought that meant Thursday. And I thought, well, that's really good. I don't have any classes on Tuesday. And it took me about four weeks into classes when one of my classmates said, how come you never come to class on Tuesday? And it's like, I didn't know we had it on Tuesday. I thought PR meant Thursday, not realizing it meant Tuesday and Thursday. So it was just a lot of little things like that. And everything from not knowing when you signed up for the meal plan that the one I had didn't cover weekends. So what are you supposed to do to eat on Saturday and Sunday. And a lot of just little bitty things like that. Until my dad encouraged me, I was too embarrassed to go ask a professor for help simply because I didn't want to embarrass myself. And 
quite candidly, you embarrass yourself more when you don't go to ask for help than you do when you go. So it's just a lot of little things like that that I wasn't really prepared for and didn't know how the college experience worked. But I have to tell you, it didn't really take very long. After about six months at University of Tennessee, certainly through my first year, I had enough knowledge of the process and the experience that I could be successful with anybody whose parents have been to college for generations. And it's a game changer. And make no mistake about it. If you have a college degree, whether it's from a College of Applied Technology, one of our community colleges, or one of our universities, you are in such a much better position for employment, to support your family, as Sumner mentioned, to be able to create dreams like Oscar referred to, than you would be if you didn't have that. And I can tell you beyond any doubt, the best time to go is not to wait 10 years when you get out of high school, but try and go as soon as you can when you get out of high school. When you look at folks who wait, they can be successful, no doubt about it, many are, but that's a much tougher climb than it is right when you get out of high school. So for folks who may be listening today, I would strongly encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity that you have in front of you right now. And I think when you look back on it in the future, you're going to think, wow, that was a smart choice. Yeah, I think if you bring up a good point that it's intimidating in the beginning, right? Like that first semester is just so hard, I feel like, specifically for first generation students, because I think the mindset is that, well, it certainly was for me that I was the only one that had these questions. I was the only one who was in this spot, yeah. right? But as I've been on this journey of, of Tennessee Achieves over the last 13 years, I haven't met anyone that was like, my first semester of college was awesome. <laughs> my grades were great. <laughs> I knew exactly what was going on. But I think we're just so nervous about sharing that, right, with others if you're first generation, because maybe that seems like if you if you start having those conversations that people will think you weren't meant to be there, um, that it makes it like almost like an internal head game that you have as a first generation student. I remember I got chicken pox my first semester. So you layer on first generation and then I got the chicken pox. And I had to miss like a, a week and a half of, of class, which was a lot of class, mm -hmm. right? It's a lot of class to miss in college. And when I came back, we were like so far ahead in my chemistry class. I thought like, I'm already not doing well in chemistry and I'm going to fail. And so much like you, Mayor, I like swallowed it all down. And I went to speak with Dr. John Bordley, my chemistry professor, who I'll never, ever forget. And I was like, I'm going to fail this class and I don't fail things like help me. And so he cut me a deal where he would um, see me every Tuesday, Thursday for one hour of office hours to like review everything that we had talked about in class at a, at a Chrissy pace. Uh, if I sat in the front of chemistry every single class period. So I was sitting in the back with all my friends as a first time freshman but then I started walking the lonely journey all the way to the bottom where I sat in the front and I was like his assistant. So when he did like, you know, experiments, he would be like, how does this feel, Chrissy? And I'd be like, hot, like it was mortifying. But I knew like at the end of the day, right, that this was going to be what set me apart. Like I had to do something to show him that I meant business. Um, and, and sometimes that means, again, sort of swallowing your pride. It does. And you make a really good point. When you're sick and you're not there, it's, it's hard to be successful. It's particularly hard to be successful if you decide, gee, you know, I think I'm not going to go to class today. I've never met anyone who went to class every day and wasn't successful. I've met lots of people who went to two thirds of their classes or half their classes and they weren't successful. The key is show up. And if you show up, that is one of the absolute biggest hurdles you've overcome right out of the chute. And it's not hard to do. It's just put it in your mind that I'm not going to miss class. I'm always going to go. And you're going to be well on your way to success. I love it. All right, Sumner, how about you? Unique challenges that you feel like that you faced as a first generation student? Yeah, so for me, it was um, it was support. And I'm not talking about like emotional support because I had the biggest cheerleaders behind me um, being my family and friends and couldn't have done it without them. But I'm just talking about support in the sense of 
you know, asking those questions and figuring things out because, you know, like you said, Mayor, we didn't have the experience. There were so many things that we didn't have the answers to and just a lot of unknowns. And in that first semester, it is so overwhelming um, just trying to figure things out in the beginning. So that kind of support, like figuring things out was a huge challenge for me. I'm kind of a shy person. And so I really had to learn to advocate for myself um, in the sense of, you know, making sure I was staying in check with my advisor or, you know, talking to financial aid if that was needed or whatever that looked like, Um, especially when it came to reaching out to my professors for things. You know, I I had took anatomy and physiology and it, it was a huge struggle for me. And I just couldn't, I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get it. You know, I was studying all the time. I just, I couldn't understand that. And so as nervous as I was to go into his office and to ask for help, I did. And I'm so thankful that I did because um, I really kind of felt at that time that I was just drowning in work and um, just trying so hard to understand, but couldn't. So I'm so thankful that I branched out and did that. So making sure that, you know, I advocate for myself and just, you know, just find the support that I needed, even though it wasn't necessarily there when I began, um, I definitely developed those relationships throughout my time there and um, found that. Love it. Yeah, I think it's support. Like it's so many multiple layers of support, Sumner, right? Like, again, you can have a really great support system at home, even if your parents didn't go to college. Um, But it's also like once you land there and you're you're navigating this path, right? I think those academic supports, I remember like really needing math tutoring. And I was like a really great math student in high school and then got to college and was taking multidimensional calculus and thinking like, I have, I have no idea what I'm doing. And then trying to figure out when is tutoring and how to get to tutoring. And then I didn't want anyone to know I needed math tutoring. Right. And then I got in there and like half my class was in for math tutoring. Right. I wasn't the only one. And so again, I think it's this mentality of, of, you're the only one that needs all these additional layers of support. But when you peel all that back, that really is nearly every college student. How about you, Oscar? Any, um, any resources, your challenges um, at Motlow and resources that have helped you overcome those? Well, a huge resource would be actually my uh, college advisor there, uh, Josh Codwell. He, any questions that pop up, I would email him immediately. In less than a day or so, he would always respond back to me, which was like one of my key things that he was a big help there, you know, and my teachers as well. Well, he would he started to recommend me, hey, might as well ask your professor and see what your professor has to say or ask him if he can stay an hour, you know. And we have here at Motlow, we have a writing center and then we have a math lab where it uh, where you can go in and they'll help you develop great essays. And the, we have our math lab where, you know, you can go in and help out doing math and stuff like that. And pretty much those were my biggest resources I used there. And they helped me get through it all the first semester with plenty of questions I had. Email Josh Codwell. Bless him for answering each one of them. <laughs> Hey, Oscar, what do you think it is that made you comfortable w- with sending those emails? Any advice that you would give to students who are maybe nervous about doing that? Well, there was no one else, I guess you can say, that I knew. And when I went there for the first time, he was someone that went up to us and talked to us. And he he communicated so much information. And he's like, if you ever have a question, you know, come and ask. So he was very welcoming really there. So I, that's one of the reasons why I really can't go to him for anything. Even so now this past semester, I was thinking about being an elementary teacher and I had told him, I was like, Hey, what if I do that? You know, how will that work? And then I looked at it and well, I looked at it and I was like, Oh, well, no, I'm not really going into that way. I was like, I'll stay where I'm at right now. You know? And he was, he was fine with it, was big help, you know? Okay. You know, part of this is about you've broken the cycle in your family. Like my mom didn't make it past the 10th grade, um, but I think she takes all the credit when it comes to the fact that I went all the way in school, which I love, by the way. She does certainly deserve much of the credit. 
But for me, I think about not only um, how it affected my parents, I'm an only child, Mayor, you're also an only child, Mm -hmm. but how it affects my children. I have three small children and I talk about it all the time. My 11, seven and five-year-olds, unlike me, talk about going to college now all the time, right? Where they're going, Um, you know, Beatrice wants to go to Swanee, but Oliver wants to go to Vanderbilt or Wake Forest. He changes his mind all the time. He's going to be that kid for me, for sure. But I love that the cycle has forever been broken. And we are now a college going unit at at the D'Alejandro house. Mayor, how do you think that affected David? um, When, you know, when you graduated, Torchbearer went on to get your PhD. Was it just then a foregone conclusion for David at that point? Well, I, I think in a lot of ways it was. And where it wasn't a foregone conclusion for me, David, growing up in a household where both of his parents were college graduates, made it a little bit easier. And he went to the University of Tennessee. I was able to help in ways that my mom and dad weren't able to help with. And consequently, he's a graduate now at the University of Tennessee, lives in New York City, does very, very well in high-end fashion advertising. Next year, my daughter will be a freshman at the University of Tennessee. I'm very proud of her. So I do think it's a generational type thing. It's much easier for the second and third generations to have that opportunity than it is the first. Not that we're special, not that uh, our challenges are just incredibly unique and so much more difficult than somebody else. But I do think you have a little bit of an advantage, maybe a big advantage when your parents went to uh, college ahead of you. So has David and Ruby Kate and, and Annie, will they get the benefit of that? I, I think they will because their parents went to college as well. Yeah. How about you, Sumner? You have, what, a one-year-old now, right? Yes, he turns one in a month. So great. That's crazy, by the way. Time mm-hmm. is so fluid, especially in the pandemic. Tell me what this means um, for your son. What do you think this means? Why is this important to him? It, it kind of means everything. Um, you know, I just, I, I can't wait to be able to start having those conversations with him. Going to start early, of course. Um, but he doesn't have to worry about breaking that family cycle. And, you know, a lot of the challenges that I went through, he doesn't necessarily have to face, but, you know, after having the experience that I have, like I can just support him and encourage him in a much different way um, than maybe what I had or um, just something that looks different. And so, I just hope that it opens up a lot of a lot more opportunities for him and that he just really has that hope that he can go on and um, do whatever it is that he wants to do and that I can support him through that. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like the, the, the conversations are so different. Like, you know, with my 11 year old, I'm like, you better start preparing yourself now if you have these big dreams of these big schools, because, you know, it's a different ball game. And I think about like, no one ever had that conversation with me. My mom was like hardcore about spelling words and, um, you know, all the things that needed to to prepare me academically, but we never talked about the next step in the journey. It was sort of what was happening right then so that I could find academic success, which worked out, but having those next step conversations, I think are also so important to begin so early. You know, we, have conversations with people across the country now about the Tennessee Achieves model. And one of the questions I always get is why 12th grade? That feels so, so late. And I agree, right? To begin conversations about college in 12th grade does feel very late. And that's part of this find your why. Like, what is it that we can do to ignite that why in students much earlier so that they can then prepare themselves for a successful post-secondary journey. So Oscar, you wanna be an educator. How will you use your experience to inspire the students that you will work with in the future? That's uh, really a question I always ask myself too. You know, I have a younger sibling who I uh, constantly ask, I'm like, what do you think you're gonna do? You know, and I'll, and just let him know there's many options out there to do, you know, and give them, and I would, for students as well, I would always say, you know, would ask them like, hey, you know, there's many options out there. Just don't stick with one. Go with as many. Try, look out, go beyond, you know, look for that stuff. Um, mostly if they need any help really outside of the classroom, I'm willing to g- give that help for any of those. I love it. 
Okay, Mayor. So let's roll back to 2008 when we started having conversations about Knox Achieves and this big dream we had of of sending every student in Knox County to college, which has really just sort of exploded, right, from, from that time. But how much do you think your experience as a first-generation student played into the creation of Knox Achieves? A very great deal, because we would look around at folks who were leaving our Knox County high schools. And a lot of folks who had parents who went to college, they were on a pretty good path. But then those of us, like me and you and Sumner and Oscar, whose parents did not have that opportunity, it was a lot more challenging for them. They had every bit as much capability as other kids did, but there just wasn't a well-defined pathway for them to go. Too many times, finances was a problem. And in addition to that, too many times, it was just a lack of encouragement or guidance along the way. So when we started Knox Achieves, it was a really well-defined program. We wanted to take away the financial burden. We also wanted to provide some help and guidance from an adult, adult mentor. And then we also felt it was important that students be able to give something back to their community, give it back in a meaningful way through the volunteer component of Knox and Cheese and now Tennessee Promise. So that was really a tremendously driving force because I could look when I would go to high schools and see really bright kids that weren't taking advantage of an opportunity later. So when we started this program along with Randy Boyd and Bill Haslam and, and others, when you were there from the beginning, it's one of those deals where we thought it could be a game changer. And I think it's, it's been that. When I look at, you know, Sumner and Oscar and uh, our future in Tennessee is really bright because of young folks like that going to college and having an opportunity. And let me say this. I don't think it's really critical where you go. I'm so very proud to be a graduate of the University of Tennessee. But if you're going to Tennessee Tech or to Motlow or to one of our great uh, colleges of applied technology, any of those options are fantastic. So just find something that suits you, that fits you, pick it, put yourself into it fully, and you're going to be successful. But when we started, I I don't think if uh, my background had been different that we would have been able to create this type of program because I had a little bit more understanding than some folks uh, that may have had a different path. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've been so proud of um, from our program from the very beginning that um, those external to Tennessee often get wrong is that it's so much more than just free college, right? Like Mm -hmm. I remember when Tennessee promise passed and, Wall Street Journal and, you know, everywhere you turned, the national media was talking about Tennessee passes free college. And I thought to myself, like, if it was just that, we would not be seeing the numbers that we're seeing in terms of success. So, you know, Mayor, talk just a a brief bit about why it was so important to to you and to us, Tim Williams and Rich and Randy and and Governor Haslam, why it was so, so important to us to do more than just free college. Well, and two names you mentioned that don't get nearly enough attention, and I left them out as well, and and shame on me for doing it, are Tim Williams and Rich Ray, two incredibly bright, successful businessmen who were there with us from the very beginning. And Rich just went off the board recently, and Tim is still a huge guiding influence for us. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned both them. But I think it would be better than free college this program would better be termed great opportunity because anybody can do free college. People have done it for years. And to be candid with you, I don't think it really works very well. Great opportunity is when you take away the financial burden to a large extent. Great opportunity is when you're paired with an adult mentor who can guide you along the way. And great opportunity is when you have to give back something to help others. Those are great opportunities that you have in life. So it's much more than free college. This is a magnificent opportunity for every Tennessee young person to go get a college education, better their life, improve their career options, and really change the entire direction of our state. And we're well on our way toward doing that. Yeah, I think that's an important piece. I think oftentimes all the programming gets overlooked for the free college piece. Sumner, and, you're a bit. Can we jump in one more thing before you go yeah. to Sumner? Uh, a lot of times people say, well, th- this young person 
and didn't have good grades. They had a terrible ACT score. I can truly relate to that. But one really neat thing about this program is it's open to everybody. It, it has no limits. It's that way by design. And we have a lot of unique programs to help kids that may need a lift up initially to get going. So I didn't, I didn't want to jump in on Sumner and interrupt, but I didn't want that fact to go lost either. No, I think you're so right. And, you know, that I've become such a staunch like proponent of that. It's for everyone. And it's up to us to help break down the barriers just because you are first generation, just because um, maybe you didn't live in the right zip code. That should not prevent you from being able to earn your college credential and break the cycle and have a different life. And I think oftentimes um, academic preparedness um, is, is sort of the burden is placed on the student and we don't think about all the different pieces that, that play into that particular, um, and it's, it's one, it's, you know, it's one factor among many, but that is oftentimes looked at as like the student doesn't deserve to go to college because of, they didn't work very hard. Well, it's probably because they were working full time to help support their family. They're all different layers to students. And I think the most important thing that we do at Tennessee Achieves Now is we try at this very large scale to meet each individual student where they are. And Sumner is a big part of that um, with our coaching model. So Sumner, how do you think your story helps play into how you work with your students? I just, I love to be able to talk about this because, you know, the challenges that I faced in college and the questions I didn't have the answer to and that support that I was looking for, but I didn't have, like, I get to be that person for my students. And, you know, a lot of my students have those same types of questions and, you know, they may also be first generation. They may also come from a lower income family. Just a lot of the same similarities. I can use my personal, you know, experience to be able to help them navigate that. And I, I love being able to do that and to just be that additional layer of support and to help advocate for them and teach them how to do that for themselves, because that was a huge learning part for me, too, um, was in doing that. So, Yeah, I think relatability is so huge, right? Like, I think many, um, all of our coaches find a way to relate to the students that they serve. Um, Oscar, how about you on the Tennessee Achieves Tennessee Promise front? Have you felt supported on your journey? It's a loaded question, Oscar. I don't know what you're going to say, so fingers crossed. <laughs> well, yes, I. Uh, Holly has been my uh, my completion coach with Tennessee Achieve, and here and there, she, she always comes up and pops up, and she always sends me a message like, "How's class going?" You know, she always interacts with me most of the time, and you know, and it's a She's a, been a huge support for me as well. She's helped me through it all. Any questions as well, I go send her message as well. There's another person I send a message now. You know, recently for FASFA, I've been having difficulties on one thing or another. So I shot, shot her a message. I was like, hey, do you mind helping me with this? You know, and she's been a great help there. So I have to give it to the completion coaches here with Tennessee Achieve you know, for the great job they always do. And, you know, they go above and beyond, I guess, as well. Thanks, Oscar. Thank you. It feels like we planted that question for you. (laughs) (laughs) No, I love it. Um, Holly's fantastic. Um, I think she's one of our best coaches. I actually think they're all the best, to be honest. I'm a little biased um, there, (laughs) but I'm so glad that you have a great relationship with her. All right, we're going to transition over to questions from the audience. Um, And so get those to me. You can either place those in the chat or type them out in the Q&A. But the first question, I think, is such a great question. And I'll I'll start with you, Mayor, but then um, ask Sumner and Oscar this question as well. What advice could you give the mentor? Mayor, you've been a mentor since the beginning. Um, a long-time mentor. Any advice for first-time or newer mentors as they start this journey? Well, the best piece of advice would be that no two students are the same. I've had lots of young folks I've had the opportunity to work with, and in many cases, some of them didn't need a whole lot of my help. They were self-sufficient and could do things on their own. There were other young folks who needed a great deal of help and encouragement, and so don't treat any two the same would be 
my words of wisdom to you. And sometimes you're thinking, well, maybe I'm not important because these young folks get it. But there's always going to be somebody who doesn't. And those are the ones that you're there for. So stay positive, work with those and dig in deep. And it's been really fun for me, me to have served as a uh, mentor since the very beginning of the program. And hopefully along the way, and I feel rather confident that I have, you've helped some folks to overcome some hurdles. And that's what being a mentor is all about. Yeah, I mean, I always tell mentors that it is the student who is not raising their hand for help that most likely needs your messages the most, right? So mm-hmm. hang in yes. with them. Um, great message. How about you, Sumner? Any words of encouragement for any first time mentors? Yeah, just don't don't give up if they are not, you know, responding to your communication. um, Trust me, they are probably reading it. They're just not responding at that time. But they they definitely hear you. And, you know, as long as you are consistent, um, I think at some point they might reach out to you um, if you're not hearing for them. So um, they need somebody who is consistent in their life. And even if you're not hearing anything, like it's really important for you to be that for them. Um, and, you know, just to keep that open communication going. Um, that's one thing that I would find super important in a mentor. I love it. I will. Say, every time I do a mentor training, I always sort of end with like, don't let the 17 year old hurt your feelings, right? Like you are the grown up. <laughs> Uh, They will hurt your feelings in the fact that they will not be as responsive as you want them to be. But the most important part is to know that you are there when they do hit a roadblock and they do have what Sumner and the mayor and Oscar have all beautifully laid out today, an additional layer of support, maybe the only support that they have as they're making this journey. Okay, Oscar, over to you. What advice would you give a mentor? Uh well, just, you know, do your, do your part, you know, as much as you can, you know, they'll take event, they'll, they'll take your, your choices of words, very neat, like, well, to them, you know, like Summer said, though, they'll read it, but they won't answer you right then and there, but just know that it's really appreciated there. I know Holly probably messaged me, one time and I didn't answer because I was b- busy reading off on something. But later on that night, I texted her responding back on stuff, you know. So it's just don't leave them hanging there. It, keep on texting and talking to them. You're saying you're layer layer on the harassment, Oscar. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, that's so what I, I heard. To say that, but I didn't want to say it that way. But yes, <laughs> I love it. Chrissy, Mayor- I saw someone just shoot something across the screen about ways of communicating. And I think that's important too. I, I'll never forget back in 2008, I tried calling all my students and nobody would answer them. And uh, I realized there was a generational gap there. So they said, try texting. And it was incredible. I started getting responses back immediately from them when I would text. So I know that you and your team at Tennessee Achieves really encourage everybody to read your email but I think initially texting is a great way to stay in communication with your, the folks you're mentoring. I think that's really great. Um, yes, texting works. We do know that. Individual text messages is what students tell mm-hmm. us. They want to hear individually from their mentor and not on a group text, which makes sense, especially if you're talking about a first generation student who, again, may be really intimidated in a group setting with their peers who they see every day at their high school to raise their hand, right? Metaphorically speaking, raise their hand to say like, hey, actually, maybe all my friends know this question or answer to the question, but I Mm -hmm. don't. Um, And so that individual text messaging, I think what we hear from students anyway, is the most effective. Another question that we've gotten, which I think is really great, and it's part of our March theme for Find Your Why, but I'd love your perspective on um, helping students find what they want to do when they grow up, right? Like helping students find their major. Um, Any advice there, Mayor? I know that when I landed, I went to Swanee on a, a math scholarship, and now I run a nonprofit. And somewhere in between that, I was a PhD student or political science. So my journey changed greatly. Um, and I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to not feel boxed in and I could explore. And, and especially first-generation students, I think, like, 
I didn't even know that you could run a nonprofit. I didn't even know that there was a major called political science, to be honest. Um, math was just something I was good at, and Swanee gave me a scholarship. But Mayor, how about you? How important is that for, um, for students as they're navigating for the first time? Well, it's obviously important that uh, you know a direction that you, would like, you think you would like to go. But I think it's equally important to not be afraid to change. When you look at you and your path and, and me, and I'm not sure what Sumner's major was in college, but even though we don't use our degree in terms of classroom experience, perhaps on a daily basis, the other things we learned in college, we use constantly. The interpersonal skills, communication skills, things like that. So I wouldn't be overly concerned about changing my major. It may take a little bit longer if you wait too long, but on the other hand, found something you feel passionate about and want to do. The key thing is to have the credential that will open the door. And that is too oftentimes overlooked because even though I'm not a teacher, which I planned to be originally, I, I certainly could not run the business. I certainly could not have been the mayor, I don't think, if I had not been a graduate of the University of Tennessee. And same thing with uh, Sumner and graduating from Tennessee Tech and some soon to be Oscar graduating from MTSU and, and you from Sewanee. Opening those doors initially is the key thing. So you can guide somebody in that direction, but eventually they're going to have to find their own way. The key, the absolute key, though, is getting in and finishing. Some people are going to graduate from PCATs and with degrees in, in welding or plumbing or pipe fitting and electricians. And later in their career, they're not going to be doing any of that. They're going to be running a business and doing something else. But they wouldn't have had that opportunity if they had not gotten the credential. So as much as it's great when you can figure out what you want to do initially, my son, David, always knew he wanted to be in advertising that worked. I knew what I thought I wanted to do. That's not the path I've taken. Either of those are correct. That's so good. And it's so right. I mean, I, I think, again, just going back to like first generation students specifically, we don't even really know what's out there once you do land in college. Mm -hmm. Right. I thought you could be like five things. Right. When you earn a college degree. Um, and so I think it just opens up a whole new set of op set of opportunities for these students. OK, we have three minutes. So I'm going to start with Sumner, go to Oscar and then end on the mayor. Any parting words of advice for, I think, it really quickly, like a first generation student. So give them advice, Sumner, and then mentors who are looking to encourage and guide first generation students. Ready? Go. I definitely think you just have to um, figure out your why and what what that fire in your belly is that kind of motivates you to push through because there will be challenges that you will face along the way, but you can completely do this. You just have to figure out your why and your why doesn't mean having an answer to what you want to be and what you want to do, but it's what's going to push you through um, to get you through those hurdles and challenges and just know that you have Tennessee Achieve to support you through this and um, just know that this is something that you can do as long as, you know, you know why. Great. Oscar? Uh, I, it's a bit what they said, really. I, I support, like, what they said already as well. So I don't know what else to say there. <laughs> yeah. What do you think has made you successful at to this point, Oscar? What made me successful right now is basically really just the amount of support and people who always keep on pushing me to do better. My, I know I sometimes post stuff about what I've been doing with college, you know, interviews like this on my social media and my teachers will be, I'm proud of you. I'm so happy for you. And I, you know, and for those prayers, praise I get, I like do it more. I want to do it more. I want to share that and everything, you know, get the word out, you know, of why I'm going there. You know, teachers are big big reason why I'm going to college as well, as well as my parents, you know? So, yes. That's great. No, that's perfect. How about you, Mayor? Advice? Three really quick points. And I think these apply to students as well as mentors. Believe in yourself. Each of us have some unique talents. Figure out what that unique talent is and use it. Secondly, encourage others around you. Whether you're a mentor or a student, it's so very important to encourage others and help them along the way. If you can keep people from getting down and a little encouragement goes a long way, I would strongly suggest that you do that. And finally, don't give up. 
there are going to be some bumps. There are going to be some real big hurdles, whether you're a student or sometimes when you're a mentor. But if you won't give up, if you'll stick with it, you're going to be successful. And we've seen that over and over in this program. And I think we're going to continue to see it going into the future. Now, all great advice. Um, I uh, very much am a proponent of believing in yourself. Again, I sort of call that fire in your belly. That's what Find Your Why for me is all about is figuring out what it is that like motivates you and really dig into that, especially when it gets hard because it will get hard, right? Like it just will get hard at some point without a doubt for everyone. It's not specific um, to you. And so lean into your support systems. Know that there is an army, especially in Tennessee behind you called Tennessee Achieves that will try to clear the path as best we can to help you find success. I wanna thank the mayor and Sumner and Oscar for today's conversation. I think it's been really great. I don't know if you're following the comments, but there are so many great stories of of first-generation students like us. So thank you for sharing those. Thanks for being a part of this journey. Um, Thanks to the mayor and Sumner and Oscar, and thanks to everyone here for your support of our program and most importantly, of our students. Thank you for watching this installment of the Tennessee Achieves Virtual Community Service Webinar. Your attendance will be automatically recorded and your one hour of community service is being credited to you. Please click submit on this screen to ensure that your attendance is recorded for you. For this community service opportunity, you will not need to complete the community service form. We hope you found this opportunity to be engaging and informative. Please watch more of this series by visiting www.tnachieves.org. We hope you have a great day. Thank you.